Hello, my friends. Uh, this is Tim Nelson, Artistic Director of In Series, and this is In Conversation in Our Pajamas. Uh, and I am very happy to be joined by Anne Majette, uh, who is a writer and a critic and a luminary arts thinker. And I think we can add a uh, homeschool headmistress to the, <laughs> to the list of titles now. How, how is that going? My son in the first week looked at me in tears and said, your career is not as a teacher. So I think it's going really great. Really? How, how old is he? He's eight. <laughs> you know, I had a similar experience. In, we, have, we live in Mount Pleasant and there's like a neighborhood grocery store um, uh, that, you know, in the, at the very beginning of this, of course, was out of everything and it was sort of pandemonium. And I went in there and there was someone in an aisle building a fort out of toilet paper. And at first I thought it might be an employee trying to restock. So I sort of walked up the aisle toward them. And this young girl who was probably like 10 looked up at me and she said, do not question my ways. They are inconceivable to you. <laughs> she went back to her toilet paper. <laughs> and she was, she was right. They were totally inconceivable to me. My son loves when there's toilet paper in stock to make forts of the toilet paper. It must be like a in, in the In the store. Yeah, in the store, yes. <laughs> he hides behind them, and then we have to like get him out and pretend he's a kitten and then adopt him, and it's elaborate. But uh, he did he did yesterday call us, and he said, Mom, Dad, come quick, my toilet's smoking. And we're both in bed, and we jump out of bed and go running in, and he put two toilet paper rolls on the lid and a paper towel roll in the, in, in the lid. So it looked like the toilet had two eyes and a cigarette. It was hysterical. Oh, that's what it's smoking. I thought the toilet was on fire. <laughs> Me. Evidently, it turns out it's like this internet meme. I looked it up and like it's a coronavirus thing that people are doing, like come quick, my toilet smoking. But um, it was incredibly clever and definitely fooled us. <laughs> so so I, I know that you are working on a, a book on the women that that made Beethoven's piano. Have you have you do you have more or less time now to, to work on that? I, I quit my job thinking this will be great. I will live off the stock market and write when my kid is in school. So that's all going really well now. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> my kid the universe was listening. <laughs> On the other hand, um, part of the reason, to, there were many, many reasons to quit my job, but one of them was that I was out, you know, four nights a week. And as the mother of a young child, that's a really hard thing to do. And I never had a weekend and the family was always waiting for me to finish a review so we could go out somewhere. And so having this intense time is really pretty wonderful. I mean, as far as healing from that, as far as working on my book, it really sucks. I have not done a whole lot on my book. Right. I mean, I have like 30,000 words on my book. It's not like I was incapable of writing before I quit my job. I just wrote, I quit to devote myself to it full time. Um, it's not going anywhere, this project I'm working, I've been dabbling at it or poking at it for years and then putting it aside to work on other books. But it's about the woman um, who built Beethoven's pianos. I mean, she was a close friend of Beethoven. Obviously Beethoven had famous pianos built by many people and we all hear about his Broadwood and his Erhard and we don't hear so much about his striker pianos. And um, we know he had many different pianos through his career. But if you go to the Beethoven house in Vienna, um, there are four Beethoven, three or four Beethoven houses in Vienna, but one of them has a piano in it. And in 1990 or 1980, I don't remember when it was, a long time ago, I was in there and um, the curator lifted the shield off the piano. I was the only person there and said, here, play. You can play Beethoven's piano. And of course I can't play the piano. So <laughs> Mortified. I, all I can play is Send in the Clowns. And it seemed to me really sacrilege to play Send in the Clowns on Beethoven's piano. So I played a few scales and chords and whatever. And um, he put it back on. I said, we're very proud of this piano. It was built by a woman. And I said, well, I thought I'd misunderstood. And he said, oh, you could go look it up. And I did look it up. And that's how this book project came to be. Um, did she work in a larger workshop or? or she had her own workshop. Her, her own workshop. Her father, was a, her father was a trailblazing, pioneering piano builder um, whose pianos were renowned all over Europe. He lived in Augsburg where she was born and Mozart, when he stopped off in Augsburg, had a heart to heart with her father and wrote to his father saying, these pianos are the best pianos. And he heard Nanette play. She was a child prodigy at the time. He heard her play and he was quite critical actually. So when she grew up, she took over her father's workshop after he died. She moved the whole thing to Vienna, to the big city where there were dozens of piano builders, established herself as one of the leaders, having in the meantime married the man she loved who quit his career to support her and uh, worked with her. So they had this thing together and they built up this large workshop and her son took over when he grew up and became Brahms's favorite piano builder. So we have this wow. family right at the heart of classical era Vienna 
with a woman at the center of it and everybody forgets the woman. People in Vienna used to ask me why I wasn't writing a book about the sun because the sun was such a great piano builder. And I'm like, you missed my point completely. <laughs> <laughs> well, at and least it happens with piano builders as well as everyone else. Exactly. <laughs> He's got some universal <laughs> truth. Mm. It's true. But, uh, but it's a fun project because it allows me to work in lots of things about the music world. It's not a straight biography that I'm doing. It's more of, I'm doing it as a historical novel, but I'm trying to find a hybrid that, so oh, that really, it's, so it's written in a, a narrative. It's written in a narrative oh. form, yeah. yeah. I felt like a, a straight biography was too, too dry for the subject and wasn't really gonna make my point about the subject. Um, and years ago, Carolyn Heilbrunn wrote a book called Writing a Woman's Life, in which she makes the point very tellingly that, um, the template of biography that we tend to have is a male template. And you measure achievement by the standards of this male template. And some of the greatest achievements of women's lives and this woman's life in particular is kind of are ineffable. People want to say, well, did she have an affair with Beethoven? What great innovations did she make in the piano? She made several, but the real thing is that she had it all and she lived at a time when you don't think it's possible to have it all that she had a happy marriage and happy children and a fulfilling professional life and was a trailblazer and you know she lived from 1769 to 1833 and those are not attributes we think of as being possible then and they eminently were and i think a novel is a better way to get that feeling across than a, an academic book and i think it has a wider audience i think there's a lot of interest out there for a book like that and if you wrote a straight biography, you might not reach as many people. That's really, you know, this year we had um, our audiences vote on Rigoletto versus the Handel Susanna. Oh, and right. They, they chose the Rigoletto, surprise, surprise. Though the Susanna was quite close, I'll, I'll give them credit. <laughs> but if we'd done the Susanna, I had hoped to, to somehow make it about Artemisia Gentileschi. And one of the major biographies of her is, is by a woman who started to write it as a, as a classical biography and then it took this other form where she wrote herself into she writes about herself writing the biography and it becomes this meta work that you know supersedes that that prescriptive biography form yep yeah i i don't think it necessarily does any favors to people i mean especially in our field because we're so locked into this iron bound template of what is right and what is good and what is canonical and trying to break that through using the same old tools, you're, you inevitably women in this in this course that we're put into come up as being second rate. Name the male composer, like oh she wrote like Mendelssohn, oh she was sounded a lot like Strauss, and this denies women their own voice from the beginning. You know, there's no way to make it if you're being compared to Mendelssohn right from the get go. I mean, yeah, or, if or if your claim to fame is that Brahms Brahms thought she was pretty good. Exactly. Okay. <laughs> Nanette's, uh, Nanette's daughter-in-law, the son grew up and married, um, the son's second wife was a student of Liszt's, and she was known as Mademoiselle 45, 40, I think, uh, because Liszt's Opus 45 was written for her. And she quit writing and went back and married Nanette's son and ended up as the wife of this piano builder. But, uh, but I love Mademoiselle. I forget the number. I'm, people will jump on me for not remembering. <laughs> but I think it's 45, maybe 46. <laughs> Basic. I wonder, um, I've, al I've always wanted to ask you about your thoughts on criticism as, a, as an art. And as a very as a varied art that you know can be approached in many different ways, and whether a critic's role is to say it was good, it was bad, or to say this is worth your money, or to just report what happened, or to like try and help the ecosystem improve and grow in a certain direction. Um, and I mean, I wondered if we could talk about that, but also I wonder if um, sort of connected to what you were just talking about, if being um, if being a female critic gives one a certain perspective and a certain opportunity to look at things differently, obviously, I imagine there are also challenges to it. But. I, that's a lot of good questions in one question. <laughs> oh, sorry. <laughs> yes, no, maybe. Um, you know, when I started out, I was, I was a writer. I mean, writing a novel is all I ever really wanted to do in my life. This is not some kind of great departure from this career. The, the career was all this weird tangent, which I'm really happy I had. 
but um, I wanted to be a writer. My whole family were artists and I looked on critics as the bad guys, as many artists do. Um, <laughs> critics say mean things. I didn't really read critics in the paper. Um, I read them when a family member was mentioned. Um, I had many, many family members in the performing arts who were mentioned. My father was a visual artist and I had an aunt who was a dancer. So I was seeing a lot of criticism. Um, so I get to Germany and I'm writing and various things happen in my life and I, I start working as a journalist and I begin meeting critics. And my, all of my preconceptions were sort of turned on their head because I was meeting these incredibly strong personalities. Um, Michael Walsh of Time Magazine, John Rockwell of the New York Times, those were my two biggest mentors when I was in Europe. And John in particular um, threw my preconceptions on their head about what a critic was because John basically loves to go around the world and find interesting things and tell you about them. I mean, that's how, at the time I met him, he was the um, roving critic in Europe. I forget what they called it, the European cultural correspondent for the New York Times back in the days of expensive. Like a nice gig. Wow. <laughs> it was an amazing gig. And he literally <laughs> traveled all over Europe doing stuff and, um, and writing about it. And, you know, I had been a writer. I always wanted to be a writer and I, I couldn't, define why that wasn't criticism. I mean, I wanted to travel around and look at things and write about them too. And it suddenly made me question like, oh, maybe criticism is not quite what I thought it was. And maybe it will enable me to live a kind of life I want to. Um, and, and also getting to know critics and learning that these were thoughtful, opinionated people was a huge sort of reconfiguration for me. There was still always a part of me, you know, until I quit the job of thinking that I had somehow sold out or taken on. I mean, I always refer to it as a bad karma job because you hurt people. I mean, people get really pissed off when you write something bad. And, and I always felt you had to own that and not be all snippy when somebody's nasty about you on social media. Like that comes with the territory, of course, because your criticism is only valuable insofar as you're honest. I mean, you really have to be honest about what you think. If you're just, if you're trying to do anything as a critic, I think you're almost failing. Um, I think some critics I've seen become bogged down on their idea of what they're supposed to do or what they're supposed to be or supposed to represent. Um, then right away, I mean, any kind of writing, any kind of art, if you're trying to take a stand, I think it damages what you're doing. Um, I'm, I don't know that I would say criticism is an art because it's a very functional thing as, as I did it in the daily newspaper for years and years. But I think any writing, any good writing, you want it to be readable, you want it to be lively, you want it to be, to convey something and to communicate something and criticism tries to do all of those things. Um, I feel that it's a real misunderstanding of criticism to think that my job is to tell anybody what to think. Um, I hate the idea that, uh, that it's a thumbs up, thumbs down kind of thing. I think of my job and um, Doug McLennan of artsjournal.com helped me formulate this when I was taking over at the Washington Post after seven years as a freelancer at the New York Times. So I'd been doing kind of full-time criticism, but I was looking at becoming a chief critic. And Doug described it as a watering hole that you want to create a watering hole, people will come. And it's not, and this is also in the digital age, a very important distinction because it's not so true back in the 1970s before there was email, you know, or before there was the internet. Um, and I, I thought that's exactly what you want. You want to give your opinion and have other people come and have their own opinions. Um, one of the terrible things in classical music that's happened is that everybody believes there's a right and a wrong answer to everything. And there are good things. And that's what our canon has done to us. It's formed this stranglehold, not only on what we perform, but on how we think about it. And so I'm constantly approached by audience members who say, oh, I love music so much. I've been subscribing for 40 years, but I don't know anything about it. I could never do what you do. And I'll always say, if you were going to the movies every night for 40 years and said you didn't know about film, we would all laugh at you. Why do you think that that's possible in music? Um, and so what I want to do as a critic is empower people to have their own opinions and that doesn't mean agreeing with me. That could mean arguing with me. That could mean that my review sparks you to think more because you agree, disagree so vehemently with me. And then I've succeeded. Um, forming a whole community of like-minded sheep is what we as a field need to break away from. This idea that you accept docilely the right answer. And um, classical music in particular has gotten locked into this. I mean, my example is when I first came to the Post and I wrote an article about why I don't love Brahms. I, I admire, I love some pieces of Brahms. I you know, I have a long relationship with Brahms. He's not my favorite composer. People are still bringing that up. <laughs> really? 
hate the Brahms. I wrote a piece about how I had grown to a, understand that John Williams is a good composer, which is again, way after the fact. And I literally got comments, this is, this is 12 years after I wrote the Brahms piece, I got comments saying, oh great, she's gonna to want to replace all of the Brahms in the orchestra with John Williams. And I'm like, you know? Like, imagine, they were paying attention. <laughs> imagine like a food critic writing and saying he didn't like broccoli and everybody's like, well, he's no good as a food critic, clearly. <laughs> <laughs> But, but it is, I wonder, um, now I, I'm biased, so I could very well be reading into your, your work. So feel free to tell me. But I, I feel oftentimes I've read reviews of yours that, um, that say this, this was, the musical standards were high, everything was great, it was wonderful. And oftentimes you don't say it, but you leave it there. That, but the, the implication being that that's not enough. And I've also read reviews of yours where you've, um, well, I'll be quite honest, even our reviews where you've said um, it would, to, to review all the individual voices would be to miss the point. Um, so, so it feels like a choice of yours to read art within a larger context of its, of its function as well as its form and, and that different, different scopes have a different um, aesthetic, I don't know, measuring rod or. Well, sure. I mean, I think that relates to what I said before. You don't, you don't want to have a template of the good and the bad. And you certainly don't want to apply the same criteria like a stamp to every piece you hear. Um, I think one of the most important things you're doing as a reviewer is to convey what the evening was about, what it was like. Like try to say what you would say to your friend in the bar afterwards. Um, you know, so if you're reviewing a student performance, you want to convey that you're not reviewing people at the Met while not dinging the students. So you you want to find ways always to talk about what level you're at. And there are some performances where the point is to review the voices. I mean, if you go to see La Boheme at the Met and they've done it 5 million times, then of course you review each individual voice. You know, what else are you going to write about? I mean, I love the opera, but we've exhausted what to say about La Boheme. I mean, we haven't because we're writers. <laughs> we can always find new things to say. But, but the uh, production's 40 years old, so there's not much left exactly, to say. <laughs> exactly. We're, we know it. Um, and the voices are kind of the point. And then there are productions, I mean, like yours, where you're doing something so completely different that the point is not that. And I always tell people who are beginning, you know, starting out to review, their biggest challenge is to find the story of the evening. And even beforehand, you can never know what that story is. Like you might be going to a new orchestral, to an orchestral performance, and you're going to hear a new work and a violin solo or violin concerto, and there's a conductor you haven't heard of. Well, the story could be the new work, it could be the soloist, it could be the conductor, it could be none of those things. Um, to go in with a preconception of what your story is going to be about, I think is a huge mistake. I totally don't believe in pre-writing any of your review. And, and I maybe have tried that twice and I had to throw it all out. People do that? Is that a thing? People do do that, especially for overnight reviews. Um, because that's, music reviewing has become so formulaic in this country especially for newspapers that I truly believe it deserve to die out and be reinvented, which I hope is what's happening now. Um, if you get a template where it's just, let me tell you a little bit about Beethoven. Let me give you checklist adjectives about the performance and let me finish it up with some, you know, platitude. And that's basically what so much of it is. And I mean, it's hard to avoid that if you're turning out four or five a week and especially on the deadlines before my time when you had to write it that night and you had, you know, half an hour to write your whole review. It, at least it was more immediate and more vivid, but, um, but there's become a real, that template is what I think you want to get away from. And so for that reason, I think you don't ever say a rule of this is how you write a review beyond you want to convey, you want to make somebody read it. And ideally you want to make somebody know whether they might have agreed or disagreed with you, even if they weren't there. I mean, I once had a, a colleague come up to me and say, that was a great review. I would have hated that performance. And it was a performance I loved. And then I, you feel like you've achieved something because, <laughs> because they got what the performance was about and they know they wouldn't have liked it. Which if you think about it, Hanslick does for Wagner. You know, Edward Hanslick in the 19th century hated Wagner and loved Brahms. But when he's writing about Wagner, he conveys a lot about what Wagner's like. He just doesn't like it. Right. But you can read it and think, well, that's exactly why I love Wagner. Um, and that's a good critic. You know, we all laugh about Hans like, and how wrong he got it. But in fact, he was much better than a lot of what you read now, which doesn't give you enough of a window in to know whether you could agree or not. You've also done a lot of writing about, uh, obviously, advocacy for women 
composers especially but also women leaders in the industry conductors <laughs> directors um and then and then talking about at least on the opera side like scale and large versus small is yeah. that sort of industry driving or conversation driving within an industry part of the role of a critic or is it just something that connected with you i always i mean as I said, I began not wanting to be a critic. And even after I began writing stories about the arts for publications, I'm like, I won't be a critic, I'll be an arts writer. Um, I never wanted to lose that. And um, I feel that by cutting yourself off from learning about the field, I mean, traditionally in newspapers, the critic wasn't supposed to write that kind of story. In the old days in the New York Times, and some, I think the theater critics still do it, the theater critics do not report on the business of theater. They only report on the artwork because it's oh. supposed to like contaminate your understanding. But what it does in this day and age, certainly, is it makes you ignorant. And, you know, it's tricky because you don't want to be too biased, but you also don't want to be stupid. And um, I really believe you need to know about the business to understand. Otherwise, you might be like, well, why did they program these two works together and they could have programmed this? And you're like, yeah, but the artistic director needed three trombones, you know, these, yeah. these logistical issues that contribute to how things happened. It's not that you should make excuses for everybody based on their logistics, but you should be informed enough to make criticism based on the facts rather than on your ideals of what an orchestra season could be, for example, without actually knowing how they're put together. Um, so I think, and, and interviewing artists the same, like interviewing artists enables you as a critic to learn more about what they do. Part of the reason you, that in the old days you didn't interview an artist and then review them is it's really bad form. You go and spend three hours with somebody and get to know them and write a review and, and write a uh, feature about them. And then you go in and write a review and trash them. And that's bad form. Yeah. Or you don't <laughs> trash them because you've gotten to know them and therefore your review is suspect. Um, so you do try not to, you know, do that. You have to try to have professional tact. But I always, and anyway, this is a long way to answer your question. I always felt that writing the features was a very important aspect of being a critic. And that was driven kind of by me, although I was a freelancer for the whole beginning of my career. So basically you write anything they assign you and you can't make a living as a freelancer only writing reviews. You had to write the features. The features are what paid better. Um, as a critic today, what papers want, in my experience, they want a lot of the opinion pieces, the kind of op-ed, you know, state of the industry things. And um, when you talk about large versus small opera, I think some of my features fed later my kind of op-ed pieces in that I would try to find subjects for big feature stories. And I did a big thing on American opera and where we are in American opera. And it was that piece, I did a couple of iterations of it actually. I did one for the Times and one for the Post. Um, with different angles over the years. I think the research for that helped inform my, what ended up being my soapbox a little bit that small opera companies really are the future because you just see so much more creativity. I mean, this is coming out in the COVID-19 shutdown now really interestingly that you see these opera singers taking to YouTube to do their videos and there's so much creativity and spontaneity and humor in these videos that more than what you normally see on the stage of the Metropolitan Opera. You can see it in smaller companies, but a lot of that spark is just cultivated away and eradicated in the, in the machinery and the machinery that requires millions of dollars and sucks all the air and money out of the room for smaller companies. Um, it would be really nice if we didn't have to equate the art with that machinery. And for this reason, I think smaller companies have the flexibility, have the inventiveness. The Met can't really do a mashup of King Lear and the Verdi Requiem. You know, people, you couldn't do it on that scale and it would be weird and, and you couldn't fill the house. The house is way too big. Um, and I'm not saying I think that all big houses should go away. I just wish there was a bigger, a more equitable cross section. And for a number of years now, most of the opera I've been seeing has, that's really exciting and interesting has been coming from smaller companies. And I can remember discussions on social media where somebody said to me, well, new opera is blooming and flourishing. And I, I said, well, what about, the big companies. So why do you even pay attention to the big companies? He said, I'm not counting those. And I'm like, well, given that my job is to cover all the companies, <laughs> including the big companies, I have to spend a lot of time going to them. And, and, you know, we had, in fact, no argument that there was not a lot of art happening at the big companies. I mean, good Lord, David Gockley, when he retired as head of the San Francisco Opera, he basically said that. He said, there's not art here. It's what did he call it? A bourgeois pastime and everybody wrung their hands. But, David Gockley said that. Yes, he did. He did. He was very um, cutting. I, I can send you the link. It wasn't, I did an exit interview with David, but it was, it was another interview that he kind of was more open and slightly 
I don't think he even meant to be denigrating. I think David Gockley has done more innovation in the big field. That's Nixon in China, right? That's, That's Nixon in China. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. I think he got worn down. He kept trying to fight the good fight and come up against board members and against the limitations of the field. And I think at a point it was just like, well, like he, he took over. He took over San Francisco San after Francisco. what's her name, right? Um, yeah, after Pamela Rosenberg. He yeah, was. He, he was in Houston. Is where he did a lot of the really important new work, and he kept commissioning new work in San Francisco. But Pamela Rosenberg, who had so many visionary ideas, yeah, I and mean, like and, and yeah. yeah, exactly. And and it was partly a board problem with her too. I mean, I think she was promised some things by the board that then they got cold feet and kind of backed out and pulled the rug out from under her. Um, there were some really exciting things that she did and was going to do there. So David comes into that a little bit more careful and they did a number of nice new works, but nothing on the scale of, you know, Saint-Francois d'Assise or Grand Macabre, the kinds of things that Pamela was planning. Do or of Atlas. I mean, in the things you're... Oops, I'm sorry, you broke up. I've lost your sa audio. I've completely audio. can't hear you. I think it, oh, oh, there. Oh, there. Oh. <laughs> That's a real life <laughs> moment. <laughs> the because my internet is unstable and I think it's an existential sort of at least it wasn't a hacker. Do you do you have thoughts on how this is gonna affect those issues, both uh, both the landscape and small and big opera, but also the place for the artist as creator or for women composers, all those um, issues? I mean, I think of necessity program as, programming is going to have to get a little more diverse because of necessity, the, the big monkey on everybody's back is going to go away. We can't count on only producing opera in 2,500 seat houses people are not going to be coming to 2,500 seat houses. You're not going to get 2,500 people. You're going to have to be finding alternative spaces, alternative ways to present. Um, and we all long for the day when that comes back and it will come back. But right now we're going to be, have to be dealing with lots of different things. I hope it mixes up programming more. Um, I, I've thought a lot about the New Victory Opera, which is a company founded by singers in Charlottesburg, Virginia. It's now the only opera company in Charlottesburg. And, they, I did a feature on them for the Post a few years ago, and I was really struck by, it was a bunch of singers who were really fed up with having worked in major opera houses for years and not getting to be creative, and also the focus on youth, that experience in a singer is not valued, and you get some young director coming in and who doesn't really know the piece and doesn't really care what you have to say about it. And um, they were, they set up their own company and are doing innovative, interesting, singer-driven things. Um, and so they're, in a way, well positioned. Are smaller companies better positioned? I mean, I really, when I wrote the article recently for Vanity Fair and talked to you for it, or actually incorporated things you said in a conversation into it, um, I was struck by the way that it was fueling your imagination and fueling your excitement. And I'm hearing that from some people, but generally people at smaller and more alternative companies. And at the bigger companies, I think there's so much denial, so much panic, and so much fear. You can't really let go of that. But Deborah Border of the New York Philharmonic, who is the most sanguine and clear-eyed and successful of arts leaders of major institution, has kind of, you know, broken the mold and showing how you really can do creative and exciting things in a big institution. And she said, we're in the business of producing orchestra concerts. That has to be what we do. And I thought that's true. But, you know, she was the first to say, we're not going to go back to the way it was. And I think there's going to, you know, connecting those two opposing thoughts is going to be the substance of the next 12 months. Um, how do you continue the idea of a symphony orchestra and the quality of the experience with the limitations that the current situation is placing on us? And a company like the InSeries can run with that, can go out and take- It's very easy for us to- it, Exactly. It's, it's easy for you. And I mean, it, it fuels the kinds of ideas you've been having anyway, and you thrive in that innovative, creative space. Um, I have no crystal ball to see who's going to succeed or fail. I, I suspect now suddenly that the middle level houses are going to be the ones. I don't think anybody's going to let the Met go bankrupt. You know, it's sort of like journalism. You know, the New York Times is going to stick around. The Washington Post is going to be there. Um, and similarly to journalism also, the very, very local papers stay because that's the only place to get that news. There's no internet source in Roswell, New Mexico, where my parents live. The Roswell Daily Record remains your place to learn about what happened in Roswell more or less. Um, 
but uh, but definitely or the future is or what or the X Files exactly. <laughs> but um, I think the future is going to be radically different, and the real tragedy is all of the artists because any alternative model you propose right now um, is all very well in a creative sense, but on a funding sense is not. And the big institutions I'm speaking of have been the ways that artists have been able to make a living. And we're looking at the entire field right now, sitting there without any income. And, and the, whole, the whole mechanism for creation is designed to, for artists not to be entrepreneurs. And That's so now true. we have legions That's of non-entrepreneurial artists who- Yeah, you know, although, goodness knows the focus so been on entrepreneurship has been extreme in music schools and whatever. It's a great time for all these entrepreneurship programs to show their mettle. Right. Um, yeah. but, but it's hard, I think, for established artists. I think it's harder for people who are, especially ones who were just on the cusp of making it, you know, people who had a bunch of sort of mid-level gigs and were looking ahead to higher level gigs and all of a sudden you have no income and you also don't know if that's going to be replicable you know or whether you're really going to have to just go work at starbucks um or switch careers altogether and there's no good career right now i mean it's not a good time for a career switch either and so it's all very well to talk theoretically and it's all very well to talk as a music critic about what i think is best for the field the fact is this contraction i think was going to happen anyway i think to a certain degree was necessary anyway because we had to stop, stop the problem of the art not being all that creative and you know find ways to re-inject the field with the talent creativity ideas with which individuals in the field are bursting there's no question that the art is great that the artists are great we just have to find a better way of getting it across to the public and to each other and getting people more artistically fulfilled um but this economic model has been struggling for a long time and all of the classical music are dying tropes is about that it's not about whether Beethoven is relevant to the modern world, that everybody gets hooked on that side of it and doesn't understand the real issue, which is about these institutions. And these institutions have been facing inside the institutions. They've been knowing how dire it is for a long time. And now, for better or worse, we can blame it all on COVID-19 and the shutdown. Um, and there's gonna be this huge retrenchment and change and it's gonna be incredibly painful and it's gonna take a long time. And a lot of things we really love are gonna be gone. And a lot of great new things are gonna come out of it. And anybody who's ever watched Goethe Dameron to the end of Wagner's Ring Cycle knows that the world collapses and a new order comes to be and that's how it happens. And in the course, you know, many things we love die and Valhalla burns and that's poignant. And that's sort of the whole premise of the ring. So we should all be used to that in the opera world. But here we are, Valhalla is burning and it hurts a lot. And, uh, and you know- you Well, and I, the, that's sort of the, the structure that becomes the, in, the institution. The, all the creativity that's happening now, I feel comes from singers or, or individual artists or from small little groups of, of artists or companies. But the ideas coming that the ideas that I'm hearing so far from the larger institutions are things like everyone's going to want light fair, so we'll make sure we're going to put comedies on, or we're just going to take the stuff that we were producing this year and produce it next year right. because financially that makes sense. But but it doesn't. I mean, the world's going to be different. Who wants to see yeah. even us? I mean, for us to do a circus version of Rigoletto a year from now would be right. vulgar. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. But you can turn on a dime better. And part of the problem these institutions have had, whether or not you have COVID, is they can't react to what's happening. I mean, even the point was made when, um, when Florencia and Amazonas, for example, came out. Um, or Moby Dick came out. Everybody wanted to see Moby Dick. But houses planned so far in advance that even though Moby Dick made the rounds, there was no way to capitalize on a hit or an audience interest to produce it in 20 cities and let everybody, you know, it, it denies opera the natural kind of fan moment that everybody has. I mean, if, if a movie by the same token, if there was this great movie, but you didn't get to see it in your town until two years after the reviews in New York, it would already be kind of old news and old hat. And yet we do that to opera all the time. But uh, I, I think, mean, well, maybe I've told you this story before, but um, when Peter Sellers was artistic director of the Ojai Festival, I think they were doing, they were going to do the Kaiseriaho no plays, um, only okay. the sound remains, is that what it is? I can't remember. Only, only the something remains. Um, uh, and it was right after the, the shooting in the nightclub in Orlando. Oh, right. Um, and that was like two months before, and Peter just scrapped the whole thing and instead did the Vivier Copernicus. 
and hired Michael Schumacher, the modern dancer, just to lay on the stage completely still for the whole thing as the body of a gay man and staged it as a funeral ritual. But that sort of ability to react right away to something that's happened. Right, right. If you want to, I mean, again, I, after 9-11, I remember writing a piece because um, Anna Kisselgoff, the dance critic at the New York Times, wrote a thing very, like within a month after 9-11 saying, where's the choreography about 9-11? And I wrote a whole piece about art's responsibility to respond and that art is not obliged to respond. And that if what you want to do is paint a still life, you know, you don't have to paint Guernica. You can keep painting your still life. Right. You know, it's like, it's about doing something authentic. It's also a response in a way. It's also a exactly, exactly. And, and responding is fine. I mean, it's sort of like what everybody's trying to figure out about the COVID shutdown. Now, if you were moved to be creative and go on the internet or write your novel, that's wonderful. If you were so shell-shocked by what's happening in the world around you that you can't create, that's also completely legitimate. You know, it's not, there's not this must. I think a lot of artists are feeling this, <clears throat> excuse me, tremendous pressure to put great stuff out there and not everybody is able to react that way. Um, you know, and particularly given, given whatever they're coming into this with. I mean, you'd asked before about, about um, my support of female composers and it's a little bit of a tangent, but when I'm talking about the system that we have, um, this is sort of relevant to say the system, as I, as I said before about my book, is, is very geared toward the canon and the canon is a male canon. And when you're a young writer coming into this system, so I mean, I, I got over my reservations about being a critic and I decided I was going to be a critic. And then I end up at the New York Times, which I didn't apply for that job. They called up and said, would you like to come write some reviews for us? And I had just gotten married and I had thought, OK, I'm, gonna, I'm done with journalism. I'm married. I'm going to go write my book. And then the New York Times called and I'm like, well, I've worked so hard. It would be really silly to turn the New York Times down. And 20 years later, I finally got <laughs> it. But, but um, but I came in and, and there's so much stuff you have to write about and so much stuff that you're supposed to be an expert in. And no music critic is an expert in everything you're supposed to be an expert in, even people with degrees. I think Richard Taruskin is the only person on the planet who is equally an expert in all fields of classical music. He'll tell you so too. <laughs> <laughs> so um, so you're just trying to, you're trying to prove yourself. And so the tendency is to go for the received wisdom, like, I mean, and I was always a bit of an iconoclast, you know, and partly because I was just doing my best with the information I had. I didn't even know what I was supposed to know. But, um, and so my reviews were always a little bit out there. But as far as what I covered, I felt in terms of what I wrote about even, I, I did a little bit of work about women, but I really think it wasn't until the last part of my tenure at the Washington Post that I woke up and said, oh my God, not only is this field not diverse and male dominated, but the only way you can try to change that is to try to speak out about it. And I have a platform and I better do that. Where before I think my instinct would have been, well, that composer's okay, but they're a little bit out there. I need to be a little more mainstream because that's my job is to be mainstream. And I threw that out the window, but it was pretty late in my career and became much more vocal about female composers, about female artists, about composers of color, just about understanding that it was my role to do that. And I wish more crit, I mean, I think at this point, all critics have realized that. I think there's been a wake up call. It's a slow field to adjust. And but what was really interesting about, about your voice in that was, um, I mean, so many of us, myself included, I've heard myself say, well, there just aren't, I mean, there just aren't the pieces. They're just not there yet. Um, and you taking the next step and saying, yes, there are, and here are the composers, and here are the pieces. Um, well, it's funny because I did a, this piece and it, was, it ended up being the 35 top female composers. It was supposed to be 50 and it was gonna be for online and they decided to run it in print and they moved the deadline up. <laughs> are you like, serious? <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> So I felt terrible because I had written it's like Moses coming down in the in the in the the fifteen no the ten. I had written the top and the bottom and like my my thirty to forty five all got left out and uh, but but so I put them all at the end and of course I got um, there were a dozen I mean you look at Rob Deemer's composer diversity database which has thousands and thousands of female composers but I remember one editor saying to me when I proposed it she said can you find 50 and I'm like you wait and see can I find 50 but um so I really tried to put a lot into that piece because I thought nobody knows these voices at all but 
I raised my own consciousness. It's not like I came in here with this deep knowledge. I mean, my degree is in ancient Greek. I don't have a music degree. Um, really, ancient just in the last Greek, couple. You said? Ancient Greek, yes. I wow. majored in classical civilization at Yale. Wow. <laughs> and uh, I wish I'd take. I wish I'd majored in music. If I'd known what I was going to be when I grew up, I would have majored in music. But I wanted to be a writer, so you know. Well, that kind of leads me to a question. I I didn't want to let you go without asking. Do you have like I don't want to play Desert Island Disc, but. Like what is what is Anne Majette's music? What? Well, it's very funny because my touchstone artists are all these like completely macho kind of chauvinist men. <laughs> to, you know, like my favorite opera composers are Verdi and Wagner. Like Verdi is my home. I could you know live with Verdi for my whole life. Um, you know, Ernest Hemingway was one of my great. Has that always been the case? Um, yeah, I mean, I would say really in the last couple of years, as I started talking about female composers, that I have gone on more and more female composer kicks and opened my own eyes, which is bitter to say that it took a professional music critic surrounded by music all the time, 20 years of a career to suddenly develop an, an addiction to female composers like Dora Pejacevic, um is like my idol right now. If I weren't writing a book about Beethoven's Piano Builder, I would be writing about Dora Pejacevich because her symphony in F, in F sharp minor is amazing. It's a great symphony. And, um, and she's wonderful. And I had never heard of her. And some people, it's so funny because people who start working on, on women composers, they're like, oh yes, we know her very well. And I'm like, yeah, great. Female academics know her very well, and people who are trying to focus on female composers know her very well, but that leaves 90% of the orchestral audience with no idea who, who Dora Pejacevich was. Um, and I forget where I was going with that, because I get so passionate about Dora Pejacevich, but <laughs> I tried to make, no, I know what it was. There was a Twitter meme recently of desert, it was this desert island thing, and, and it was 10 composers, and it was opera, vocal work, chamber, you had to pick one for each heading. And, you know, your default is all of the men that you love. And then I thought, how would I do it if I did an admixture of women? And who would I pick? And I went all these delicious byways of work I've been meaning to get to know better and work I would really want to be with on that island and um, try to figure out which category I would pick which woman for. Should I do Emily Meyer because she wrote eight sim or seven symphonies and I only really know one of them. But on the other hand, are you tired of 19th century symphonies and you'd rather have Gloria Coates who's written how many? I think she's up to 17 or more symphonies. Um, you know, if you're on a desert island, it depends how long you're on there. Is, is um, that your, your, do you prefer like the symphonic repertoire? Well, I prefer opera and then really? I prefer opera, but uh, opera is my home base completely. I mean, when I began writing, I was writing about opera and the visual arts and the idea of being a music critic was never, I mean, being an opera critic was sort of daring enough, but opera at least has always been home base. I just have been passionate about opera. And now that I've left my job, I'm still passionate about opera. That's, that's where it is. Um, but, uh, but, and then vocal music, anything with vocal, so symphonic repertoire with vocal music and, and choral a little less, I mean, choral beyond the Verdi Requiem and the greatest hits kinds of things. But, um, but so much great work is being done with contemporary, I mean, a lot of great women composers right now are doing amazing things in the music theater realm. Yeah. Um, and also there's a lot of writing for their own voice, which I find yes. really powerful. Yes, absolutely. But I mean, Kate Soper and Missy Mazzoli and Caroline Shaw and so many of the female composers today, Sarah Kirkland Snyder, um, those all four of those women have written amazing works and I, had, I don't know their whole oeuvre at all. And those would all be Desert Island. So, so asking my favorite, I mean, you get sick of your own, not, I don't get sick of Verdi, I get sick of having Verdi as my favorite, you know what I mean? Right. So I'm, I'm in a phase right now, particularly there's a delicious thing right now to not having to. I am under no obligation to like anything. I am in no obligation to pontificate about anything. I keep writing blog posts and then thinking that's way too facile and not posting it and then taking it and stewing over it. And it's such a luxury to be able to do that because often they're very smart posts, but you never, as a critic, as a, as a critic for a daily paper, you just have to put the stuff out there often. And then you think about all right. the nuances afterward. And I stand by what I wrote. I'm not saying, oh, I, but it's just delicious to be able to ruminate more and by the same token it's delicious just to be able to listen to the music that you want to listen to without having to come to a conclusion about it because very often it leads you to a place that you might not get to if you were in the framework of having to produce it for a newspaper.
Did you take a break after uh, after leaving the post of going to performances? No, I've been given a break before this break. <laughs> <laughs> no, I did. I did take a break. I mean, I was really, I was a little burned out. It was a lot of concerts to go to and, you know, leaving my family every time and the number of babysitters, it was just logistically difficult. And I just, I think these jobs, I think people should change every 10 years. Um, somebody said that to me early in my career when I was interviewing him and I was really surprised by it. And I've stuck with it ever since. Ironically, I think the person who said that it was Götz Friedrich, who stayed for 25 years as intendant of the Deutsche Oper Berlin, thereby proving his point that he should have left after 10 years. <laughs> so, uh, yeah. Sometimes the problem with those jobs is you have to have someone else that wants you to come. <laughs> <laughs> That's true. And there's no place else to go. I mean, right. I'm very fortunate that it worked out that I was able to leave. And I don't take that for granted because it was a happy confluence of things. But obviously, normally you don't have the luxury of just being able to say, oh, well, that's it. I'm going to go on to the next thing now. And yeah, especially um, if you're at a place like the Post, I mean. Exactly. There is no other. I mean, you can go to the New York Times, but it's kind of the same thing. I'd rather be at the Post than at the Times, having worked for both. And um, and music criticism is is just as vexed at the times right now. I mean, they're doing a great job. They have great people. They just have been trying to, we're all trying to reinvent the wheel because we need a different shape wheel <laughs> and to, right. in terms of how we cover things in terms of what it means to cover the field in terms of the understanding that you can not cover the field. There's too much going on. So what are the things that will be most telling in conveying a picture of what's happening? How do you do the balance between reporting on the world famous names coming to town and the grassroots organizations who are feeding the soul of your audience? Um, those answers have been a challenge, I think, for 50 years in this field and are only getting more so as, as the field compresses. Um, it's going to be interesting. I mean, my successor, Michael Broder, took over the week of the shutdown and he was he was in the office for two days, one of which was HR, and then they were all sent home. And he hasn't been able to review anything yet. And, so, and is, he, is he been able to do features or? He's done some features, done some great features. He's out there doing work and he's covering the news stories. And um, But he tweeted, and I keep quoting his tweet, so forgive me, Michael, but uh, he tweeted that I'm pretty sure that whatever the first concert I review is, is going to be the best thing I've ever heard in my life. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. We'll all be in a race to get that. <laughs> <laughs> but I mean, um, we all feel that way. Like the first piece we see when this is over is going to be amazing. <laughs> yeah, I hope it doesn't let us down in that case. <laughs> um, so, so last question, are there things that you uh, are provided the fall season happens? Are there things here in town that you were looking forward to or that you would encourage us to check out or? You know, that's a really interesting question because it, again, was a luxury not to, have, not to be following it. And also the seasons are being announced like now, like Washington Performing Arts never brought their season out. Um, I genuinely was always interested in what you have been doing at the in-series. Um, I've always encouraged people to go. Uh, I, I definitely, you were high on my list. Um, I'm trying to even remember because in shutdown time, I mean, I think Noseda and the NSO had a more interesting season coming up. Um, I'm just really not thinking right now in terms of what the Washington scene is doing and what I should be recommending. Um, so, so I don't have any particular highlights beyond that. Now, I'm sure people will squeal because there's a lot of exciting stuff coming up. But, uh, but at this point, well, I think- It's hard to remember what it was even because- I what it was. And I think we all feel with Michael that whatever it is, it's going to be amazing. I mean, right, it's so- yeah. Yeah. Well, the things we see, and I think, I mean, the internet, the live streaming stuff on the internet is a pretty good reflection of what it's going to be like afterwards. There's a lot of stuff that's well-meaning and kind of dreck, and then there's a few amazing things, and we're all in this sensitive state where the amazing things really stick with us, so I've developed passionate attachment to the things I really like, and I think that's going to happen for all of us. Maybe it will make our relationship to music even more intimate because we'll be experiencing it with so much emotion and feeling when we do yeah, hear an openness to exactly exactly like people after you know the war when they finally got to go back in the bombed out buildings in germany and hear these pieces it takes on or after the wall fell there are so many moments when music has been more than just a concert and i think we're going to go through some of that and that that's wonderful and important and maybe healing yeah i feel very much like i should have paid more attention in computer science class <laughs> and i should have learned to play the ukulele 
<laughs> I feel unequipped for these times. <laughs> no more ukulele. I think you're good on that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm a bit tired of the ukuleles. You got it covered. <laughs> well, Ed Majel, thank you so much for, for chatting so long with us today. It's, it's really been a pleasure. Well, thank you for having me. I appreciate it. And, and good luck. Whenever we get out there again, I look forward to seeing, seeing you at, at the, in the scene. I will be there. Absolutely. Okay. Thanks, you. Bye-bye. <laughs>